uh, also not only the pilot has special uh, requirements, but the vehicle, the UAS itself, must weight less than 55 pounds at the time of operation. So if you have an UAS that weighs close to 55 pounds and want to use it with the payload and the total weight of the vehicle with the payload will exceed 55 pounds, this is violating the part one of seven rule. It also must undergo the pre-flight check by a remote pilot in command or the person that is supervising. So you always need to check the UAS before operating it. Um, and there is additional rule that um, applied from the beginning of, uh, um, uh, of uh, from um, introducing the Part 107 in August 2016 uh, to May um, 2017, that you have to register the drone. But uh, there was uh, um, there was a, um, someone like sued the um, FAA that it's not. Uh, legal for them to require the registration and they won. So here you can see that uh, for over a period of time, uh, the um, registration was not a requirement, but uh, the registration is back uh, with the um, th with third December 13, 2017. So right now, if you have a drone, if you buy a new one, or uh, if you want to use your old one, it has to be registered. It is a fee of five dollars, uh, and it's in a really straightforward process how to register your drone. The commercial use of the UAS also is regulated by where you can fly. So there are requirements of the location, and here we have a chart that shows schematically how is uh, how the airspace is divided into classes. So there is class A, that is everything above the 18,000 feet, and it's forbidden to fly with a drone there. Um, there is class B, C, and D that are closer to the airports, and you can uh, operate the UAS there only with the permission of the local air traffic control. The class B is for the bigger, uh, the biggest airports, and then the C for smaller, and D for uh, even smaller um, airports. You can see that the um, the airspace, the classes, uh, look kind of like upside down uh, layer cakes. So um, the area where the uh, where the airplanes just land, take off or land, is smaller. But then when there are in the air, they need more. Um, the radius of the operations is uh, just bigger. Um, so uh, you will see in a moment how it is um, depicted on the two-dimensional maps, how you have to um, read and see the circles where do they, um, how does it look like in, um, in, uh, in reality. So there's uh, also class E and G then uh, where the um, the vehicle um, can operate without uh, notification to the next tower without permission and uh, this is um, uh, class uh, G and E. This is the, the example of a chart. You can see a lot of circles. The circles represent the um, layers on the layer cake. Um, we're going to talk just a little about that because the, uh, reading the charts is pretty complicated, has a uh, really extensive legend, and we just can't cover it all in one lecture. But if you're interested in uh, taking the uh, Part 107 certification exam, here are the links for the, um, for the resources that I found the most helpful in reading uh, charts. One is a short chart reading tutorial. This is a really easy to read, easy to follow, not technically dense a tutorial that uh, explains all the, mm, the divisions and uh, of the airspace. And it's really short, uh, written not specifically for pilots, but for the 
uh, um, unexperienced users. There is also some uh, in course that is uh, compiled by FAA. So you can here see uh, in details the explanation of the airspace. And here is how the legend to the uh, to the this chart looks like, and all the uh, parts of the legend are explained here in the um, um, in this short article. And you can recognize how on the charts what different symbols uh, mean. Uh, the easy way to remember the layer cakes uh, to what group, what class do they refer to is that the solid line always represents higher class than the dashed line and blue line always represents higher class than the magenta line. So this translates to solid blue class B, solid magenta class C, then dashed blue class D and dashed magenta class E. The operating rules for the commercial uses of the UAS, they also need to fly under 400 feet above the ground level, or if they're flying um, at altitude that is higher, they need to stay 400 feet, feet off a structure to avoid the structure. Uh, you cannot fly from a moving vehicle unless you are in the sparsely populated area. And you must fly at or below 100 miles per hour. Uh, this is also important that you have to um, fly during the daylight hours or it is permissible to fly 30 minutes before official sunrise to 30 minutes um, after official sunset in local time, which is called uh, civil twilight hours, but you have to have the appropriate anti-collision lightning. And you always must yield right of way to a manned aircraft. That is pretty obvious thing that men aircraft always have uh, the priority over the uh, UAS. So just get out of the way. Uh, the operator must keep must keep the UAS in sight, so in a visual light of sight, and it needs to be done by the remote control, uh, the remote pilot, or um, or by the visual observer. You cannot fly intentionally over people. These rules apply to the all commercial users, but there are some businesses that recognize that it will interfere with what they want to do with the UAS or with the data. So the FAA found a way uh, how to control and how to check the safety of those operations. Uh, so some of the rules that I mentioned before can be waived. So if you want to operate the UAS uh, outside of rules, you may apply for the certificate of waiver. You have here under the link uh, the explanation from the FAA website uh, how to obtain the uh, waivers, how to apply for a waiver, and what are the available sections of the part 107. So the FAA will grant waivers uh, that can be performed safely but otherwise will not be allowed after part 107 concerning the rules that we talked about before. Uh, there are only some sections of the part 107 that can be waivable. So the operation from a moving, ve uh, moving vehicle, a daylight operation, visual line of sight aircraft operations, the visual observer, operation in certain airspace, yielding to the right way, operation of multiple small unmanned aircraft systems, because be, uh, the regular rule in part under seven is one pilot for one UAS. There is also um, a waiver for operation of the people and operating limitations for the men, um, men aircraft itself. 
the possibility of obtaining a waiver doesn't necessarily mean granting the waiver. FAA carefully evaluates each request and grants after um, after considering the safety issues, grants or refuses the waiver. You can see here the um, uh, statistics that the most wave applications uh, or requests were uh, uh, regarding night operations and also approved uh, petitions, uh, mostly a uh, vast majority was about uh, um, allowing for night operations. Um, but uh, contrast to that, operations over people, the 35% of all the requests um, were regarding this section of Part 107, but uh, as of January 2017, only one request uh, had been um, approved. Uh, there was also a lot of uh, requests, almost 20%, to uh, go and fly beyond the visual, uh, visual light of sight. Uh, and only three uh, requests were approved, and it's only for experimental reasons. Um, as far as I know, right now, the operations over people, there are two approved um, requests, so two waivers have been granted. Uh, there are also the oper um, um, operational limitations, the altitude, 9%, and the same for the operations from the moving vehicle. Um, there have been uh, also waivers to have an authorization to uh, operate in the, in the certain class. And here you have the numbers. Uh, there is a lot of waivers that have been issued um, in this, uh, for this part. Uh, there is a requirement in, uh, in the Part 07 that no later than 10 days after the operation, um, th there needs to be a report, if any, accident happen. Uh, but not only accidents need to be reported, only those that uh, include included serious injury of person uh, or loss of consciousness or the damage to property uh, other than the UAS itself, that the UAS damage the property that will be uh, over $500. Here we have the link to the uh, official FAF, uh, FAA accident reporting form. We are moving now to a very important part of the lecture when it's going to be covered where are the places that you're not allowed to fly, fly with your drone, so-called no drone zones, how they're divided and where to find information about them. There are multiple airspace restrictions. Some of them are security-sensitive uh, airspace restrictions. Uh, there are temporary flight restrictions that are there, they are published and they are not there forever, uh, as they're called temporary. There are also restricted or special use airspace. We're going to talk uh, more about each one of them in later slides. Uh, also, the stadium and sporting events, they have, um, they have different restrictions. Um, uh, special rules uh, about operations. There are also uh, areas with wildfires and airports that have different uh, mm, different rules and regulations. The security sensitive airspace restrictions are set forever. They are visible on charts, and uh, and you can you can you can check. Uh, mm, check them on the permanent paper maps, as well as the electronic versions of charts. Uh, and the UAS flights there are just prohibited. You can never fly there. The restrictions extend from the ground to uh, 400 feet, uh, feet above ground level. And there are, uh, they're applied to all types of uh, um, operations and um, uh, all types, uh, all purposes. Uh, and then remain in effect all th all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is the, uh, if you want to see uh, the legal definition of that, you can check uh, the circular uh, published by uh, FAA. 
there are some uh, zones that are rest uh, the restrictions are there only temporary. They're called TFRs or temporary flight restrictions. And uh, there is here the link to the map and to the list of the uh, TFRs. You can he see here the map of the um, of the TFRs, and you can enlarge. Uh, the area that is of your interest. As you can see, there are not so many uh, TFRs right now in uh, in use. I mean, uh, active T TFRs. There is also uh, a list provided here that you can see the details. Um, I can uh, so here on the lecture, you have a screenshot about one that is uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, so the uh, area of airspace the, where the travel is limited uh, because of some hazardous condition like wildfire, chemical spill, uh, or security related event. Sometimes they disclose what, uh, what kind of hazard it is, sometimes it's not. And uh, the uh, TFR contains always the, the details about the restriction, the size, altitude, time period. Uh, this you can see that the, the temporary, the, this uh, um, these restrictions are only uh, all from 11.30 to 2.300, so it's from 7.30 um, in the um, Eastern, uh, Eastern time. Uh, so it's not um, all around the clock. There is restricted of, or special use airspace, and this includes prohibited areas, Restricted areas, warning areas, and military operation areas. You can find all these uh, definitions on the chart on the airspace map. And the airspace surrounding the Washington DC is the most restricted in the country. You can click here and uh, read more about uh, why is it, uh, is it illegal to, uh, to fly in the drone in DC. There are also some alert areas and controlled firing areas, CFAs. They're also uh, included in the, in the um, updated in the electronic map. Now we move to stadiums and sporting events. So only um, UAS is uh, operation are, are prohibited within the radius of three nautical miles, but it's only for the venue of the major sporting events like Major League Baseball, uh, National Football League, um, uh, NCAA Division I football and uh, NASCAR Sprint Cup and other uh, races. Uh, and uh, the temporary flight restrictions can be also found uh, on the airspace map, the, the updated electronic maps, not, um, no, of course, not on the uh, paper form. And here you have more info. There's a handout about uh, sporting events uh, because it is pretty common that people want to um, peak uh, and use their drones to just um, monitor or see the games. Um, about the wildfires, the situation is pretty simple. It is just illegal to fly in the wildfire. Of course, it doesn't uh, apply to the rescue missions and to people that are eligible and are there to help. If uh, But if you fly, we can't. This is the slogan for uh, the private users or recreational users, commercial users to not to avoid the wildfire areas. Uh, within the airports, the recreational uh, operations are required to give notice within five miles, both uh, the airport operator and air traffic control tower. Usually on the uh, electronic, electronic versions of the maps, there is a phone number provided uh, where you have to uh, um, call the tower. Um, and uh, their recreational operations are not permitted in uh, Class B airspace, so around the biggest uh, um, air, um, air, um, airports in uh, the United States. Uh, of course, without a specific air traffic permission and coordination, the airports uh, can have their internal um, surveying or the internal uh, investigations using drones, but they, uh, they then the people operating drones have special permissions.